your current goals and your, those goals can change over time. And so your exercise can change over time. And I think sort of understanding that, you know, if you do cut back on your exercise now, it doesn't have a huge impact on your long-term performance or, you know, anything like that. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Clark and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Nicola Rinaldi to the podcast. We're digging into hypothalamic amenorrhea and how to restore your period. Dr. Nicola Rinaldi has a PhD in biology from MIT. Since experiencing hypothalamic amenorrhea, otherwise known as missing periods herself, Dr. Rinaldi has been on a mission to spread awareness of the condition and how to recover. In 2016, she published the book, No Period, Now What? This book is a comprehensive resource that includes much of the medical and scientific research that underlies our current understanding of triggers for amenorrhea and what steps to take for recovery and treatments to use for recovery and pregnancy as needed. In addition, Dr. Rinaldi performed the largest survey to date of women who likewise experience amenorrhea and includes results from the survey, answering many of the common questions women have, such as how long will it take to recover, will I be able to get pregnant, and will I resume cycling after pregnancy. Finally, the book includes Dr. Rinaldi's own story, along with those of hundreds of other women, providing hope and reassurance to women following in their footsteps. Since publishing No Period Now What, Dr. Rinaldi has been a guest on multiple podcasts, attended the ACSM and and SCAN conferences, presented the winning poster at the 2017 Female Athlete Conference, and now works with clients on period recovery and getting pregnant. Definitely check out her website at noperiodnowwhat.com. Before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Dr. Rinaldi, excited to have you on the podcast. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, awesome. So if you could share your journey and how you came to do this work. Sure. So I I was actually in graduate school at MIT doing a PhD in computational biology, which is kind of completely unrelated to this. But towards the end of my graduate career, I was starting to think about getting pregnant. I was in my mid third, late, early 30s and, you know, it's kind of that time when people started to think about that sort of thing. And so I kind of started doing some reading and I read, you know, lose weight to have an easy time getting pregnant and have a fit, healthy pregnancy. And so I was like, oh, okay. And some of the guys in my lab were, you know, going on a diet. And so I said, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll join you. And so I cut my calories to what I now know was an extreme, you know, it's sort of in the range of what's often recommended for weight loss. But at the time, I was also doing a fair bit of exercise. I was playing ice hockey and volleyball and lifting weights and biking and playing golf on the weekends. So I was quite active. (laughs) And so I, you know, cut my calories. I lost a bunch of weight. I thought I looked great. You know, I had the six pack I'd always wanted, you know, blah, blah, blah. But when I went off the pill a month or two later, I didn't get my period. So I went to see my OB and she said, oh, well, you know, it often takes a few months after you get off the pill for your things to regulate. So if you still have no period in three months, come back and see me again. Well, I still had no period in three months. So I went back and saw her again and that led to a bunch more testing. And eventually she spoke with a reproductive endocrinologist and um, they came back and told me that I had hypothalamic amenorrhea. So this was something that I'd never heard of before. And so I went and started you know, Googling, this was early 2000s. So it was, you know, there was some information online, but really not much about HA. I call it HA rather than the hypothalamic amenorrhea because that's a mouthful. (laughs) Yes. So there wasn't much out there, but I sort of got a sense that, okay, maybe I needed to increase what I was eating a bit and cut my exercise a bit. And so I did that. And eight months later, I finally had my first period, but I, I, I was getting impatient. I wanted to be pregnant. So I had scheduled an appointment with a reproductive endocrinologist anyway. So she did a few more tests after that. And I had a follicle that was you know, showing up on ultrasound, but it didn't grow. So she said, oh, you're never going to do this on your own and let's just do injectables. 
So I did four cycles of injectables that failed. Um, I seemed to have ovulated, but I didn't get pregnant. And so I was in kind of in a dark place at the end of that. And we talked about doing in vitro and my had insurance that would cover it a few months later. So we took some time off. And during that time, I ovulated on my own and got pregnant, mm. uh, you know, to my utter astonishment and thrill, obviously. <laughs> and then after that, when I was pregnant, I ended up being on bed rest for a while. And I found an online community of women that were likewise suffering from HA. And I had lots of time on my hands at this point because I was on bed rest. So I started posting about my story and I started doing more research and, you know, helping other women kind of understand what was going on. And eventually, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist by training. So anytime a question would come up, I'd, you know, go and look in the medical literature and see what I could find. And eventually after years of posting on the board, people would sort of say to me, oh, you know so much, you should write a book. And I was like, huh, yeah, I should. So I did do that. And that culminated in my book, No Period, Now What? And so over that time, I've become an expert in everything hypothalamic amenorrhea mm. from diagnosis to what to do to recover, along with a um, hundred of other little questions that often come up when women have this, you know, how long will it take to recover? And so that that's sort of my story in a fairly large nutshell. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And so I'm going to call it HA because yeah, uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea or no period. So really, how does that uh, impact fertility? Obviously, without the period, that makes it uh, a little bit difficult. Yeah, so I mean, basically what happens is there, there's a control center in your brain called your hypothalamus, and that sort of starts the process of a follicle growing and an egg maturing each month, along with doing a whole host of other things. So women with that have HA are commonly very cold because their hypothalamus has kind of shut down their thermodynamic system because with just generally not enough energy, there isn't enough energy to keep you warm. There's not enough energy for hair and nails. There tends to be like, there can often be lower bone density. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that kind of goes along with the missing period. The biggest effect on fertility is that when you have hypothalamic amenorrhea, you are not ovulating. And so therefore you cannot get pregnant. And so the, the result of the non-ovulation is then no period. So it's, I, th I think it's actually really important for women to understand the, the key driver of the whole process is not your period, it's the ovulation. And so the ovulation, after ovulation, your progesterone increases and it's the drop in progesterone when you're not pregnant that then causes you to get a period. So it's very possible to get pregnant without ever having had a period because you can get pregnant on your very first ovulation and then no period and you're pregnant. So it's, I think it's good for women to understand that, that the ovulation actually comes first and then the period after that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are trying to track their ovulation and do you have any tips about that or what's your, your take on, on that if you don't have the period? And well, obviously that's not, that's not HA, but... Well, so generally, you know, the sort of fertility awareness method where you're mm -hmm. looking at cervical mucus and, you know, often before you ovulate, the cervical mucus changes to the egg white type mucus. Mm -hmm. You can also take your temperature. That doesn't tell you before you've ovulated, but it can tell you after you've ovulated. A lot of women that I work with use the ovulation predictor sticks, which lets you know when your luteinizing hormone surge is, your LH surge, because that happens about 24 to 36 hours before before ovulation. So that really is, you know, and so the sticks measure that LH surge. And so then you can know before you ovulate, which is actually the ideal time to have sex in order to get pregnant, if that's what you, if that's what your goal is. Yeah. I've interviewed um, Lisa Hendricks Jacks from, uh, okay. she's the podcast, the host of the podcast Fertility Friday. And she was on my episode 20 and we talk about the menstrual cycle and and um, the impact with um, diet. And also I've, I've interviewed her for my blog as well. So yeah, we talk a lot about cervical mucus because I think a lot of people yeah, with, the, with the kits and stuff like that, we don't even really even know like cervical mucus. What is that? How do yes. I find it? You know, and it takes a yep. couple months to kind of understand the whole process, but to really actually, you know, we're not taught this in school to get really familiar with our bodies and see how the whole thing works. Yeah, I think it's so important and it's so cool. Like when you notice your cervical mucus every month and you're like, hey, I must be ovulating. It's really really empowering to know your body like that and to know what's going on. So mm -hmm. I definitely encourage women to learn as much as they can about that. And Lisa is a great resource for that. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So the causes of HA, what are they? So it's sort of 
There are a number of factors that play a part. It's a combination of underfueling, so not eating enough in terms of either amount or sometimes types of food. So like women who are very low carb can sometimes experience HA because the spikes in glucose and insulin that you get when you eat simple carbs can actually help support your hypothalamus. And if you're not getting those, that can help shut it down. So amount of food, types of food. Exercise can help shut down your period because actually high intensity exercise can cause increases in stress hormones like cortisol and those can shut down your hypothalamus. Obviously psychological stress can do the same thing. I mean I think a lot of us sort of hear these stories about women who lose their period, you know, going through a divorce or you know through the death of a loved one that kind of thing. Um, that's sort of an acute stress. There's also chronic stress, so if you're a naturally anxious person, um, that can that can sometimes sort of play a part in in amenorrhea, if you're a student and you're going through a very stressful time, often it's the combination of those. So stress on its own doesn't do it, but stress plus some underfueling can cause you to lose your period. Often it's sort of a low level of underfueling that's then supplemented by somebody deciding to say start training for a marathon and the increased activity, there's often not an increase in fuel to go along with that. And so that increased activity then causes the amenorrhea. Another factor is actually weight loss, and it doesn't have to be recent. Sometimes it can be a few years in the past, but that sort of seems to set our system up for predisposition towards HA. I did a survey of about 300 women that I included a lot of data from in my book, mm -hmm. and I was actually really surprised when I analyzed the data, and 82% of them had lost more than 10 pounds at some point in the past. So I was kind of shocked by that number. You know, it was even women who are in naturally smaller bodies, a lot of them had lost weight because, you know, that's what society tells us we have to do. You know, we have to be as small as possible. So a lot of them had lost weight and then lost their periods along with that. And then the last factor is genetics, and that's obviously something that we can't do anything about, but it helps explain why sometimes you can look at two women who seem very similar in terms of their eating and exercise habits, and one woman might have her period and the other one doesn't. And so part of that is just, you know, an accumulation of small mutations that we might have in the various proteins in our in the, the sort of reproductive system pathway or the pathway around the hypothalamus. And that can be enough to sort of, again, predispose you to losing your period if you then start going on a diet or increase you know, the, you know, your high intensity exercise. So I think generally the biggest factor is underfueling, so not eating enough. And I think for, for many women that can be unintentional. Like if you exercise a lot, you often, you're, it, that can suppress your appetite. And so it's not even like you're trying to lose weight or anything, but you just are naturally not eating quite enough to support the, the amount of, you know, your daily functions and the amount of exercise that you're doing. And that can lose, lead to a missing period. And so typically a BMI below 19, is that what you see or... Actually, it's, it's a much wider range than that. The median BMI at which women have lost their periods is about 19, but that means that 50% have a BMI higher mm. than that. So it's absolutely the case that you can lose your period at just about any BMI with the underfueling. And that's actually a really good point to bring up because a lot of doctors will just look at women and say, oh, you're not thin enough to have that be your problem. And it's like, it's not about your actual body size. It's more about how well you're fueling your daily activity and your exercise and everything else that you're involved in. So those daily, yeah, the daily foods. So it's, so even maybe you may not be eating those nutrient dense foods or enough fats or yeah. really if you're on this restrictive diet. Although you're saying it not, might not necessarily just be a diet, it might just be way the way people eat. Yes, and the the other thing to mention is there was actually a really interesting study done in Sweden where they looked at two groups of women who were ostensibly very similar. These were elite athletes, but they had the same amount, you know, similar amounts of exercise, similar amounts of caloric intake, and one group had their periods and the other didn't. And they actually found that for the women who didn't have their periods, they had more of an energy deficit throughout the day. So they were the women who were not eating breakfast when they first got up, but waiting until, you know, maybe going for a run first and then eating afterwards. And so just that extended time during the day, which we kind of call intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. that, it, that intermittent fasting not having an energy balance throughout the day was what seemed to be leading to their missing periods. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying 82% of people that, that lost 10 pounds or doesn't in the last couple of years, I guess you said it was, then they, that was 
had to give them at a higher risk of having HA. So even some weight loss. Yeah. Which, yeah. Mm, sure. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was 82% of people who lost weight. It was of the women that had hypothalamic amenorrhea, right. 82% of them had lost weight. So it's mm-hmm. a little bit of a difference. You know, it's not like everybody who loses weight is also going to lose their yeah. period, but it definitely predisposes you to, to losing your period. Yeah. And you, and you talked about stress. So we talk about that a lot as well. So with, yeah. so the stress of obviously there's me- mental, emotional stress, there's structural stress, like a pinched nerve, something in your body that's out, uh-huh. of, out of alignment. There's gut infections too. So if you've got a parasite yep. or something that's causing stress on your body, it's another form of stress. The, yeah, the environmental toxins. So a lot of people that, you know, your personal care, your cleaning chemicals, your water, all uh-huh. these things that we're ingesting, those can cause stress in the body. So yep. yeah. What's your take on yeah. that? I, I think that I think that's absolutely true. And I, you know, another another form of stress is the whole idea of counting your calories mm. and controlling the food that you eat. I mean, even even that level of stress, you know, we don't necessarily things that we don't necessarily feel as quote unquote stress, they can still be, you know, that that sense of having to control things, having everything be perfect, that that can be that can be stressful as well. So I think there are like there are many, many ways that that our bodies can feel stress, even if we're not necessarily sensing it ourselves mentally. Mm-hmm. And then, so with the hot, with the exercise and the connection with HA, so can you dig into that for a little bit more with us, the over exercising? Yeah, so that seems to be a relationship between sort of the adrenal system and the, and the hypothalamic system. So when you engage in high intensity exercise, there are studies that show that that increases your cortisol and cortisol can suppress your hypothalamus. So it's absolutely the case that many women can exercise to very high levels and continue to menstruate and they tend to be fueling that exercise better. So again, it's kind of a combination of the two. What I have found though, is that when somebody has lost her period, it's very difficult to continue to engage in the high intensity exercise and regain one's period at the same time. Many women try it mm-hmm. because it's really hard to give up that exercise because many of us, you know, love the, you know, love the exercise that we do. I, I, you know, I've played ice hockey for over 20 years now and I just enjoy it so much. It feels good, you know, and, but I think when it becomes a way to try and control our weight, when it becomes obsessive, like you feel like you have to exercise every day, you know, that's, even if you are getting your period, I think that's a good place to get out of because actually our fitness isn't dependent on us exercising every single day. And, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of myths around that. You know, you can be very healthy and exercising three times a week and that's fine. And, you know, taking rest days is actually really good for you. So, but yeah, so I think the, it's the high intensity exercise that's particularly underfueled, uh, again, whether intentionally or not, that really seems to cause the issue and needs to be cut out for a while in order to recover the missing period. It's never forever. Like there, you know, there are women that I've worked with who, you know, cut out running for the time being and now are back to running marathons actually with better times than when they were under fueling, which is, you know, not surprising when you really think about it. You know, I've worked with an Olympic athlete who cut out rowing for a while and now she's training again for the Olympics in 2020. So it's, you know, it's a short term change in habits that can sort of allow your system to recover and then you can slowly add back in exercise and hopefully remain fueled and continue to menstruate normally. Yeah. And we get a lot of questions about exercise for fertility and we typically don't recommend any vigorous exercise, but we like fertility yoga, brisk walking, the high intensity uh, interval training, weight training, maybe three times a week. But, and then, and really also, you know, how do you feel the next day? Because I guess if you're like if you're already if you're running marathons, now may not that may not be the best thing right now if you're trying to conceive. But yes. how do you feel the next day? Are you dragging your? Because I think sometimes we don't really know how we're feeling and kind uh-huh. of the body. So the next day, are we dragging? Are are we tired? Or do we feel okay? And I guess in this case with HA, it's also combined with the underfueling and then potentially vigorous exercise. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it tends to be sort of vigorous, high-intensity exercise, so things that are getting your heart rate above 140 beats per minute, that's sort of a, a reasonable guideline. I do also want to say that there are plenty of studies that show that women who exercise vigorously, even if they do continue to menstruate, their cycles are not necessarily normal, so they will either have a shortened luteal phase, which can make pre- getting pregnant more difficult, or they will be not actually ovulating. So there was a study done by Mary Jane D'Souza, where she showed that it was about 50% of runners. Then she also did a similar study in just general exercisers. About 50% of women who were exercising three hours a week or more were either having a short luteal phase or an ovulatory cycles. So if somebody's exercising a lot and having a hard time getting pregnant, um, I think that's definitely something to look at. You know, really figure out, are you ovulating? When are you ovulating? How long is your luteal phase, which is the time between when you ovulate and when you're when you normally get your period? Because there are certainly things that you can do, and cutting out high intensity exercise for the time being when you want to get pregnant is definitely one of them that can help with both of those. Even if you kind of haven't gotten to the stage of not you know not having a period at all. Yeah, what's your tips for that? If someone just like loves the high intensity exercise and they that's just part of their lifestyle, they've always exercised a lot. And I work with a lot of women that that's the case, type A driven and exercise, like a lot of exercise is just part of their lifestyle. And now sort of saying slowing down. And then even if I recommend yoga, they want to do hot yoga. Yeah. Vinyasa flow, <laughs> that's not the stuff. point. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. We're looking at Hatha, restorative. You may yes. feel like this is like I'm sleeping. It's too slow. So yeah. Yeah, what's some tips that you help with the ladies you're working with? Well, I mean, I think it's really important to take a look at what your goals are. You know, if your goal is to get pregnant, then yeah, you're going to have to change your life a little bit maybe. And certainly once you have children, your life is going to change. So there's nothing wrong with starting that now. I often recommend sort of trying hobbies that you've, you know, trying new things that you've been interested in in the past, but not been able to make time for because, you, you know, if you're exercising an hour or two a day, that's actually a lot of time, you know, spending more time with friends and family, like people that make you feel good about yourself, people you you enjoy being around. um, That's a great way to sort of take up that time that you used to spend exercising and still do something that you enjoy. You know, I love getting outside and walking and just Mm -hmm. kind of being in nature and particularly again with a friend, you know, going for an hour long walk, you're getting some coffee or something. That's sort of just focusing more on things that really make you happy outside of exercise. And I think also realizing, as I I mentioned before, that, you know, there's always a time and place for exercise later on down the road. It's not like if you choose to cut back now, that's something you, you're never going to be able to add it back in. It's the, you know, for the rest of your life. It's like, no, this is a short time period and you, you might have to make some changes to help you get to the goals that, you know, to your current goals and your, those goals can change over time. And so your exercise can change over time. And I think sort of understanding that you know, if you do cut back on your exercise now, it doesn't have a huge impact on your long-term performance or, you know, anything like that. So it's, yeah. 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 And I think so if people are looking, if you're at an hour or two a day, which is quite common, is it, is, are we looking at 30 minutes or, or we're just looking at the form of exercise? Um, I think it's a combination of both of those sort of I recommend like two, at least two to three full rest days a week. So, you know, if you've been doing an hour of running or elliptical or biking and you're doing that every day, like take a couple days where you're just, you know, maybe doing a little bit of walking, but maybe binge watch some Netflix or something. (laughs) (laughs) But really having those days for your body to recuperate from the exercises is important. And I often also recommend cutting down the time per day. So, you know, going to half an hour instead of a full hour. And also, also lowering the intensity a little bit. You know, if you had been running on an elliptical with your heart, you know, running on it, you don't run on an elliptical. You know what I mean though. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had been on an elliptical and your heart rate was between 160 and 170, you know, maybe you cut that down to 140 and just, you know, go a little bit easier. So there are ways to sort of keep doing some exercise, but lowering the intensity. And certainly any woman that is missing her period completely, I very, very strongly recommend that. Like not no heart rate above 140, you know, really focusing more on resting and nourishing your system, eating more for sure, 
I recommend about 2,500 calories a day, which can seem like a huge amount if you've been restricting to 1,200, say, but you know, that's really a, a good place for our bodies. And in my book, I have a lot of explanation of the science behind that number and how I get to that. It's not just a random, like pick out of a hat, you know, that's, that's well supported by science that that's actually the amount of calories that our bodies need. And, you know, in terms of, you have to think about all the things that energy is being used for. It's pumping your blood breathing, your brain, creating all the new immune cells that your body creates every day. I mean, there's there is so much that our bodies do that we don't even think about. And that all requires energy. So, you know, when you're limiting your calories, you know, to 1200 or 1500 or 1700, and you not allowing your body to have what it really needs, you know, it has to choose between, okay, do I make you breathe? Or do I make you reproduce? And obviously, it's going to choose breathing. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have a whole different take on the calorie thing to say, you know, what, why don't we just forget the counting okay. calories, and really, you know, shop the periphery of your grocery store, like Michael Pollan or Palin says, Palin says, you know, if your great grandmother says, if your great grandmother says, what is that? Don't eat it. So, you know, don't eat processed food, eat, eat food that, that is, is, you know, nutrient dense, healthy fats. And I think it's this old way of looking, yeah, with, with the calorie thing is, cause we get, yeah. yeah, we get caught up in it. Yeah. Right? No, I know. I totally, I, t- I totally agree. I think it's important that women kind of understand just have a, a basic sense of, okay, I actually need to eat a lot more than I'm used to. Yeah. And that's okay. So that's why I throw out the calorie. Oh, totally. Yeah. Not, no, like good. I definitely don't recommend, you know, you have to track every day and blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's really just understanding that your body actually needs a lot more than you think it does. And particularly if you've, you know, if you're missing your period. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so, so 2,500 is a good, if, if people are tracking to have a, an idea to say, wait a minute, maybe yeah. I'm like really, really under this level and really yeah, to yeah. Again, yeah, but then definitely getting rid of the tracking over time and learning to eat more intuitively, you know, not letting yourself get hungry, I think is really important. You know, I think a lot of times we are encouraged as women, as, as we've talked about, to be as small as possible. And so we tend to ignore our hunger, hunger signals. So, you know, if you're missing your period, you know, listen to those hunger signals, learn to feel them again if you've ignored them for so long that you don't even feel them anymore. And, you know, part of that is why, I, also why I throw out that calorie number, because if you've been under fueling for so long, you don't necessarily even recognize that, you know, when you're feeling hungry. And so just saying, okay, I have to eat, a, you know, I have to eat about this much every day. And then over time you do start to feel hungry again and you, and then you can start to sort of pay attention to the signals and honor them and treat your body the way you would, you know, you would want your friends to treat their bodies and you would want your daughters to treat their bodies. I mean, I think that's really important where we often tend to be very um, self-critical and unkind to ourselves and much more so than we ever would to our friends and sort of getting out of that mentality and, you know, appreciating ourselves for who we are and not for what we look like, um, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. That self-care. I have people do an exercise. It's from Louise Hay, where you you look in the mirror and you say, I love you. And sometimes if you Mm -hmm. you might start that by like peeking around the corner going, I love you. Because it's sort of, and then, and because to say that and look deep into your eyes and really say it is because a lot of times we look in the mirror and go, look at my hair. Oh my God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, absolutely. We pick out every single little flaw and Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. Yeah. And another exercise we have actually is the, the hot towel scrub where you actually you stand in front of the mirror naked and you just, you scrub your body and it is, it's good for circulation and, and also the whole self-love too, with being able to, to know that your body is a, it's a beautiful thing, right? And a lot of times mm-hmm. we want to, we want to say mean things to ourselves where it's yes. like, okay, wait a minute. We're, it's just to focus on that self-love and self-care during, during this time. Is really- yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And now, so as far as an ED disorder, how would that play into HA? So it's very common for women with eating disorders to lose their periods. Absolutely. And again, it's because of the underfueling aspect of it. And, you know, in somebody that has maybe a binge eating, binge eating disorder, they can also be missing their periods because again, they have the, you know, very variable, you know, long times of energy deficit and that, you know, that can cause the missing period. So I 
you know, I'm not an eating disorder specialist by any stretch of the imagination. I really encourage women that do have bona fide eating disorders to work with, you know, to find a good team, a therapist, and, you know, work with a dietitian who's qualified to help somebody with an eating disorder. I have, a, I run a Facebook group that's, you know, women supporting each other through these missing periods. And we do have some women in there that do have eating disorders, but I really encourage them to be getting outside help as well, because, you know, I'm not qualified to, to speak to people with, you know, to speak to or about people with eating disorders. There's so much more at play there in terms of the, the psychology and all of that, that, you know, it's, it's beyond my realm of expertise. Mm-hmm. And, but obviously there's just a link to HA then because um, yes. with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the body is having to prioritize, you know, organ nourishment over, you know, being able to, you know, have a child. So it's definitely very common. Not everybody who's anorexic does lose their period. It certainly doesn't mean that they are, you know, healthy. I mean, but again, you know, there's the genetic factor and, you know, so many other things that, that go into play. So it's not everybody, but I think it, it is a vast majority of women with anorexia who do lose their periods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as far as the birth control pill and HA, what's the, what's the, the link there? Um, so I'm not sure there is the specific link. I don't think that the birth control pill causes HA. What it does do is it completely masks HA. So for many women, they have no idea that they're missing their period because they've been on birth control. And so they, you know, they might have changed their behaviors. They might lose some weight, start a new exercise routine while they're on birth control and they continue to get a monthly bleed. Um, so they think that everything is fine. Some women do actually lose their period, do stop bleeding when they're on the pill. And that's, you know, that that's even a bigger warning sign. You know, if the, if the hormones you're getting are not sufficient to make you bleed, even though you're getting those external hormones, that's, that's a real sign that there's something wrong with your system. I mean, there's, there doesn't seem to be anything about the birth control pills that necessarily cause HA, but like I said, it's, you know, it masks it. And often women that don't have a period are told, oh, go on the pill, it'll fix your bones or what have you. The research to this point doesn't actually really support that. In a woman who's not willing to work toward recovery, so she's not willing yet to eat more or exercise less, being on the pill is more beneficial for bone density than not being on the pill. It does, you know, so in that respect, it does help protect your bone density. If you have HA and you're on nothing, then the bone density loss seems to be about 2.5% a year. Whereas if you're on the pill, it sort of maintains it where it was. Um, Although if you lose more weight, you certainly also will lose more bone density. But it's it's a Band-Aid. It's not a cure. And it's, I wish that more doctors would understand the link between under fueling over exercise and losing one's period because they do tend to just prescribe birth control pills and that doesn't fix the underlying problem and certainly having your own natural hormone cycling so that gives you the estrogen the progesterone follicle stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone inhibins prostaglandins all of that you know plays a big role in not only bone health, but, you know, heart health, brain health, you know, it's really beneficial for our systems overall to have the, you know, to have those monthly changes in our hormones. And so I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, the birth control pill at all. <laughs> Yeah, we have a lot of women that come to us that have been on long-term birth control, and there is a, a post-birth control pill syndrome where it impacts your microbiome or your gut flora as well as your all your, uh-huh. your nutrient nutrient levels. So, uh-huh. and and then a lot of people are put on it, yeah, when if there is an issue instead of addressing that issue, and yeah, then, and then it masks it for all these years, and then you come off and you don't really know what the problem is, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's much better to investigate rather than putting a bandaid on. Mm-hmm. And so, how do we diagnose H? H A. So that's a that's a great question. There isn't a great diagnostic tool. It's sort of a combination of understanding eating and exercise habits, weight history, period history. You know, in somebody who's had you know who 
had semi-regular cycles as a teenager and then, you know, went on birth control and now isn't getting a period. Chances are that it's not some underlying disorder, but, you know, if they've, if, if they've then been under fueling and exercising a lot, then that, you know, that certainly suggests HA. A common marker of HA is a low baseline LH level. So that's the luteinizing hormone. Mm -hmm. Normal is typically somewhere around five to six. Um, with HA, women often have a, an LH level of less than one, less than two, it might be two and a half. So it tends to be either below normal range or sort of low normal. So a lot of times doctors will look at it and say, oh, that's normal. But it's like, well, not really. I mean, an LH of two is not really, it's not what most women see. So that tends to be the most common blood work marker of HA. It's also really common for HA to be misdiagnosed mm -hmm. as PCOS. So women with HA will often have what are called multifollicular ovaries. So they'll go to their doctor, they'll say, I'm not getting my period. The doctor will say, okay, let's do an ultrasound. They'll do an ultrasound and they'll see a lot of follicles on the ovaries. And so they'll say, oh, you must have PCOS. But in fact, the diagnostic criteria for PCOS require that HA is ruled out first. So you should be, the doctor should be then looking at, you know, again, exercise, eating, weight loss history. Also at, at blood markers. So it's it's, you know, women with PCOS will often have elevated quote unquote male hormones. So mm -hmm. testosterone, androstenedione, dione, DHEAS, a woman with HA, those are all going to be low. So that's another, you know, that's another way to look at, you know, sort of the HA versus PCOS. It's important that doctor doesn't just look at the ultrasound and say, oh, lots of follicles must be PCOS. There are specific diagnostic criteria for PCOS, which is more than 25 small follicles on an ovary or an ovarian volume of more than 10 cubic centimeters. Those are often not true in women with HA. Um, so they do tend to have a lot of follicles, but not getting to that level. And so I think it's mostly about sort of assessing the lifestyle factors, looking at the LH level, looking at the male hormones, the, the androgens, and sort of making an overall taking an overall look at somebody and being like, does PCOS make more sense or does HA make more sense? And it can be the case that somebody with HA might develop PCOS down the line after she's recovered from HA, if that's already an underlying condition. But regardless, it's really important to address the HA first because if you have both, then you have your whole, your whole hormonal system is suppressed. And so that makes it more difficult to respond to any kind of fertility treatments. Whereas once you've sort of released the repression by fueling adequately and cutting out that high intensity exercise, even if you do have PCOS, you then have a much better chance of responding to any kind of interventions that, you know, that might follow down the line. And so how would someone, I guess, with their doctor advocate to make sure that, um, that it wasn't mis misdiagnosed, really to, to, I guess, be aware of their numbers and ask questions. Yeah, I think it's really important in a woman that has been sort of following an HA type lifestyle to make sure that the doctor is looking at, you know, the androgens and, you know, any physical symptoms of PCOS, which can be sort of male pattern, hair growth, acne that doesn't, you know, doesn't respond to normal treatments insulin resistance, you know, if that's actually measured and looked at. But to, to just throw out a diagnosis of PCOS without any of those sort of corroborating factors in a woman that, you know, has been under eating, lost weight, over, or, you know, exercising a lot, I think is really a shame. And I think it's really important for patients to advocate for themselves and be like, huh, you know, does PCOS doesn't really make sense for me. Could it be, you know, hypothalamic amenorrhea instead? Yeah, I do have um, I do have some resources available on my website that describe this in a lot more detail, and I have the chapter from my book um, sort of describing the differences between HA and PCOS mm -hmm. um, available for free download because I think it's so important this diagnosis is correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, how do we restore the period? Then we talked a little bit about this, but how do we? Restore. Um, it's very easy to say it's eat more, exercise less and reduce your stress. Mm -hmm. um, but that is definitely much easier said than done. I think 
a lot of it is because we kind of have to turn everything that we think we know about health and nutrition upside down because we've been told for so long that, you know, you have to diet, you have to eat as little as you can, you have to exercise as much as you can. And so to sort of push back against the societal norms is actually really challenging. And I know many women that have sort of tried and then they get a little bit down the path and it's kind of like, oh no, I can't do this. And so they, you know, they regress and go back to their old habits. One thing that really, really helps is having support of other people around you who are going through similar things. So that's why I started my Facebook group because it's really, it helps so much to have people to go to, to talk about the, you know, the things that you're feeling about cutting exercise because for many people in society, it's, you know, it, they don't like to exercise. And so for somebody who has really enjoyed exercising and now has to cut it out often doesn't feel a lot of support in her, you know, in, mm. in her normal life. So having other, you know, surrounding with yourself with other people in a similar situation and having that support can be really, really helpful. Okay. So the exercising to kind of cutting that down, obviously reducing stress, like what are some tips that you recommend, I guess, for that? So I think a lot of us with HA tend to be sort of type A perfectionists mm -hmm. and learning to let go of some of that perfectionism is incredibly challenging. You know, we just, it, I mean, there's a lot of sort of self-help resources out there and podcasts and websites and, you know, doing meditation, you know, starting your day off with something that can help you kind of calm and center yourself. You know, it's surrounding yourself with affirmations. I like to um, encourage women to sort of find a few statements that resonate with you about why you're doing this, what your goals are, and, you know, put them on your mirror or places, you know, have them around you when you get into, you know, in situations where you often feel, oh, I need to, you know, I can't eat that or whatever, you know, if there are sort of typical places. So just it's a lot of, like you said, it's a lot of working on self-love and all of that. I mean, it's, it's really hard to reduce the perfectionism and all of those tendencies. I think knowing that that's, that that can be a problem and that, that that can play a part in a missing period can also be helpful so that you know that it's something that you do need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We run uh, mind body fertility groups where we focus on, um, yeah, the tools of mind body. So affirmations, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. visualization, mindfulness, like even incorporating mindfulness into your daily routine, daily routine with mindful chewing or mindful hand washing or a, a mindful walk, uh -huh. um, or even going for a mindful jog if we're doing that. Cause a lot of times we're listening to a podcast, although please listen to this podcast, but yeah, yes. like, <laughs> But yeah, sometimes it's like going out and not with your phone and just actually being out in nature to actually be present where you are. Because a lot of times we're, we're running, listening to something or going somewhere and that, that type A kind of go, go, go mentality just to yes. slow down. And a lot of my clients, I'm like, okay, we have to slow down. And they're like, what? Yeah. I, yes. have, the same, I have the same thing. I'm like, okay, wait, I have to, I used to like pile all these things on top of myself. Well, I don't need to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So the body will just say, hold on. And in this case, it's HA. So it's sort of being able to, to really, yeah, clue in and listen to your body and see what it, what it needs. And yes. a lot of times it doesn't need more stuff. It just needs to actually be. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. And then the exercising piece, we talked about that. And I guess for, do you have a, a certain diet that you recommend or what do you recommend to your people? I don't recommend a specific diet. I think, you know, generally foods that are calorie and nutrient dense without taking up a lot of volume. So I will often recommend to people that they cut out sort of salads for the time being, you know, cut out some of the fruit intake because those can be things that fill you up really easily, but don't actually contain a lot of energy. So I will often recommend cutting those out. And again, this is, this is the short term thing. It's not a long term thing. But cutting those out in favor of things like nuts and um, seeds and avocados mm, and healthy. Yeah. yeah. I do recommend um, for women that have been doing some kind of low carb diet to introduce some simple carbs. Um, because like I mentioned at the beginning, one of the pathways that sort of our hypothalamus senses is our glucose and insulin levels. And if those are constantly low, then that can keep the hypothalamus suppressed. So incorporating some simple carbs like rice or, you know, other things that you feel, you know, that you feel comfortable with can be, can really help with that. I also encourage women to just sort of get over 
fear of foods. Like there are certainly foods that are more healthy to eat in general and foods that are less healthy to eat in general, but having a bite of a cookie is not going to, you know, it, it's not going to all of a sudden cause major health impacts or anything like that. So I do encourage women to sort of get away from being afraid to eat certain foods and really just eating uh, you know, eating some of everything, eating things in moderation, you know, things like if you eat a ton of carrots, that can, you know, that can have negative health impacts. It can, it can make your, it can, you know, can turn your palms orange. So I think really going for the idea of moderation in what you do, you know, basically in your whole life, I think can, can really help with, you know, the whole recovery process. Yeah, we believe in a lot of variety of foods. Obviously, we look at a food sensitive, a sensitivity testing, and then we do an yeah. elimination diet, taking out dairy, gluten, corn, soy, peanuts, and eggs, and then systematically bring it back in to see if there's mm -hmm. a food sensitivity going on. Mm -hmm. but, having, but having said that too, like when, if you're talking about having a cookie or a piece of cake, instead of if there's deprivation going on, like literally sit down with a nice plate by yourself mm -hmm. at the table and really enjoy that food that you're eating because a lot of yes. times we might just like you know grab the bag or grab the ice cream container or whatever it is and, and like stuff it down where it's like let's just sit here and sometimes you don't even need the whole thing it's mm -hmm. if you do mindful chewing with a really delicious piece of chocolate cake that can be like satiating in itself because a lot uh -huh. of times there's guilt and things like that around that so yes that's, that's more like the emotional eating side of things but yeah because there is a lot of yeah societal pressure and, and that whole low fat thing where people are eating like I did that for years eating low yes, fat yogurt. Yes, me too. That was, that was my you know? thing. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, no, wait a minute. We need the healthy fats. And, yes. You know, yep. and, and I did an episode, episode number 16, we talked about healthy fats and all the ones to, to add in there. Like, you, like mm -hmm. you talked about with nuts and seeds and avocados and avocado oil and, and olive oil. So there's, and coconut oil as well. So there's lots of good things to, to add in and yeah, yep. just bulking up on salads and not eating some of that, some of the nutrient dense protein and, and fats may not be a, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's funny. I used to have an argument with my dad growing up. You know, this was this was during the 1980s, early 90s when low fat was the thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, he would cook with olive oil, and you know, he'd say, "But you know, olive oil is healthy." And he'd be like, "Yeah, but Dad, it's still fat." <laughs> and it turns out he was right. <laughs> yep, yep. The whole Mediterranean diet, right? <laughs> yes. Yep, yep. And so, as far as a success story that you'd like to share, does anything come to mind? I'm sure, you got lots. Oh, yeah, I have tons. I mean, I think the most inspiring success story is actually, I actually co-wrote the book with two women mm -hmm. that I had discovered through, um, you know, I, they were on the, that forum with me initially. One of them was my co-author, Lisa Waddell. Um, so she had amenorrhea for about 20 years. Wow. She came to my to my group and, you know, I sort of, she learned about, you know, the idea of more calories and exercising less. And she sort of tried it half-heartedly. And then she's like, eh, this is not for me. I can't do this. So she went away and she left for about two years, came back and she was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to really do this now. And so um, she increased the amount she was eating. She cut out her exercise. She was actually a physical trainer. So she, mm. um, you know, she said she put on flip flops instead of sneakers so that she couldn't do the exercises along with her clients. And, mm -hmm. you know, so she would watch them and, and support their form instead of actually doing the exercises herself. And she regained her period in five months at mm. the age wow. of 39. So, you know, it's really, there's so much to when we actually make the decision that we want to recover, that, it, you know, letting go of, you know, it, it allows us to sort of stop thinking so much about the being thin and being focused on our appearance and focus on really our true health. And I think it's really important to know that, you know, the length of the time that you've been missing your period doesn't really impact the time to recovery. I did, a, that was one of the data points that I collected from the women who took my survey. And it turned out that the median time to recovery was about six months. Hmm. And that was irrespective of how long somebody had been missing her period for. So there were certainly women who recovered faster and there were women who recovered slower than that. But, you know, I think it's really helpful for people to know that this is not, you can recover, you know, when you put your mind to it, you can do it. And 
it's, you know, you haven't ruined your body. You haven't destroyed your fertility. That's actually another survey that, I, another question that I asked in the survey. And it turns out that once women recover their ovulation and periods, there's no di difference in fertility between them and anybody else. So this is not something that sort of has a long-term impact. It's your body has shut down, but it's perfectly happy once you actually provide it with what it needs to recover and then to be, you know, to, to, be able to reproduce or whatever else it is that you that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so setting the intention and, and getting support is yeah is most important. Yeah, and so yes. you you're offering our listeners a, a discount on your book, so they yes. can go to P G N A T ten. Sorry, excuse me, they're not going there. That's that's the code. That they're <laughs> yep. They can go to no period now what forward slash book forward slash products and then use that code P G N is a Nancy or naturally AT10 and you can get a discount. So can you maybe share what they'll, what they'll get with that? So that is the site for my book, which you can either get as an ebook or a paperback. Yeah. So it's basically everything that you need to know about hypothalamic am amenorrhea. It includes my story, the story of hundreds of other women, ideas for support, ideas for other activities to do if you, you know, if you have trouble cutting out your exercise and all the data from my survey that, that I've talked about, as well as, you know, I, as I said, I'm a scientist by training. So so everything that I say in the book is supported by references to the medical literature. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. all very well supported by evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so ebook or paperback. Yeah, it's no period now what.com slash book slash products. I'm not sure if you would get there without the dot com. So. Forgot that. I got to put that in there. There you go. So yeah. no period now what.com forward slash book products. And we'll have the link in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate your words of wisdom on this topic. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Hey there, Sarah Clark here. So are you struggling to have your baby? First of all, please know that my heart goes out to you. I support couples worldwide who are struggling with infertility to conceive and have healthy babies. Women like Rita, who gave birth to her beautiful daughter after following my fertility coaching system or Danielle, who after two failed IUIs was able to get pregnant after a supercharger fertility discovery call with me. So here's how you get my help for free. So I offer a free supercharger fertility discovery call, and on that call, I'll create a plan with you that is going to help you fast track your success. So this call is not for everyone, and I'm really picky about who I get to speak with, and I have a strict but totally reasonable criteria that needs to be met in order for us to move forward. So here's who I can help. So first of all, you need to be able to explore your infertility diagnosis in a new light. So this offers for people who are open-minded, they're coachable, and if, you, and if you can do that and want to double or triple your chances at the fertility clinic or get pregnant, awesome. So let's get on the phone and chat. Also, you must be an action taker. So someone who's committed to seeing results, you're able to follow directions. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything bizarre. But if you're one of those people who like to consume a ton of information, but don't like to spend time implementing and seeing results, then the call's not really for you. So I only wanna spend time with people who are genuinely committed to their own success. So just click on the link in the show notes and apply, or go to fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on the free consult. So it's a really short application that just tells me about your health, how long you've been trying to conceive, and how soon you like to be pregnant. So seriously, this is gonna be the best time you've ever spent on your fertility. Looking forward to chatting. Talk soon. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a US resident, text FERTILE, to 345-345, you'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. So for U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.yogafreebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E.com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie, 
F R E E B I E dot com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time.